got five people already joining the live stream. That's awesome. Go hit that like button as soon as you join in on the live stream. The algorithm will pick up the video and spread it around for more people to join in. We're going to have a lot more fun in the comments section if more people are joining in on the live stream. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about the credible threat theory. Now, I know this is something that I have covered so many times. I've gone over these speeches over and over again, but I just see it so prevalently now in the economy that I have to continue to talk about this and we have to expose it for what it really is. Now, before the Federal Reserve even started to move, with their Fed funds rate. I was one who was saying they are going to use the Fed funds rate as the credible threat, not the movement of it, but the threat of moving it. And this is what we're seeing within the economy right now. I mean, think about it. The Federal Reserve has done nothing, nothing for months, right? But at the beginning of the year, everybody was new. They were positive that the Federal Reserve was going to be lowering interest rates going into the future. And they started acting accordingly to it. Right now, the Fed hadn't done anything yet. They were just sitting on their hands, basically putting out there the forward projection, the idea that they were going to be lowering rates. And people started to act as if they had done it already. This is the credible threat theory. And it's playing out really well. Like the Federal Reserve doesn't have to move rates. All they have to do is make sure that the communications that they put out there is credible enough for people to believe that they are going to behave in a particular fashion. And this is how the Federal Reserve is conducting themselves. Now, I have a list of speeches that I have gone over time and time and time again to try and expose this for what it is, this monetary policy, because most people have got it wrong. Like, I don't know how many people I have heard out there on the mainstream media within the, you know, professional economists and stuff like that who do not bring up anything of, of what monetary policy is being explained by the Federal Reserve. They don't bring up anything about it. Right? And so I want to show you guys again, like through these speeches, the, Fed, the Federal Reserve themselves, not like, you know, some far off, you know, crazy lunatic with tinfoil hat on or something. This is coming directly from the Federal Reserve itself. And it, it's so telling of, of what it is that they are that they're doing here. Now, I start with Ben Bernanke's speech. Ben Bernanke gave a speech back in 2002 talking about deflation and how to prevent it from ever taking place here in the United States. It was a major concern of theirs. Right. And now in this speech, I'm not going to go over the whole thing because it's just like it's very detailed and it's very long. But he gives an example of what the credible threat theory would be, right? And he talks about it with the idea of a gold machine. And now here's the exact little paragraph that, uh, that describes it. It says, the conclusion that deflation is always reversible under a fiat money system, right? Deflation, deflation was the problem, right? Def uh, or at least the concern. Un uh, under a fiat money system follows from basic economic reasoning a little parable may prove useful. Today, an ounce of, an ounce of gold sells for $300, more or less. And you got to think this was back in 2002, and that's pretty crazy to think about today. All right, because that's, what, $2,100 higher today? All right. Um, $300, $300, more or less. Now, suppose that a modern alchemist solves his subject's oldest problem by finding a way to produce unlimited amounts of new gold at essentially no cost. Moreover, his invention is widely publicized and scientifically verified. And he announces his intention to begin massive production of gold within days. What would happen to the price of gold? Presumably, the potentially unlimited supply of cheap gold would cause the market price of gold to plummet. Indeed, if the market for gold is to any degree efficient, the price of gold would or the price yeah, the price of gold would collapse immediately after the announcement of the invention, before the alchemist had produced a produced and marketed a single ounce of the yellow metal. Right? So right there, he was talking about just the sheer idea, the credible threat alone that this guy could produce this gold would send the markets plummeting. All right? What has this got to do with monetary policy? Like gold, the U.S. dollar have value only to the extent that they are strictly limited in supply. But, the U.S. government has a technology called the printing press, or today, its electronic equivalent. That allows it to produce as many U.S. dollars as it wishes at essentially no cost. 
but increasing the number of U.S. dollars in circulation, or even by credibly threatening to do so. The U.S. government can also reduce the value of dollars in terms of goods and services, which is the equivalent of raising the prices and dollars of those goods and services. We conclude that under a paper money system, a determined government can always generate higher spending and hence positive inflation. So just the credible threatening to do so would be enough to create the inflationary scenario that they are anticipating, right? Or at least, you know, the idea behind it. So this was given back in 2002. This is before the great financial crisis. This is before pandemic. This is before all the other stuff that was going on out there. And if you continue to read this speech, he talks about curing deflation and how it is that they were going to go about curing deflation. And they talk about asset purchases and all the other things that we are experiencing right now. Right. This was all to cure deflation. Remember that. So this is pretty incredible to think about when you have so much inflationary pressures that are now being pushed upon the economy and the people's expectations out there is that there's going to be this rampant inflation going into the future. And now it seems to me that this is very much in line with the credible threat theory coming from the Federal Reserve. When you go all the way back to John Williams speech, monetary policy strategies for a low neutral interest rate world. This was given November 30th, 2018, right? Today, we face an altogether different set of problems from a very low neutral interest rate. That is the short term real interest rate consistent with an economy operating at its potential alongside low and stable inflation. Ironically, the problem we need to solve these days is the risk of inflation that is persistently too low rather than too high. Remember, November of 2018, that's when this speech was given. So the problem that the Federal Reserve was facing is that even though they had all this money printing going on from the quantitative easing of one, two, three, and four, they failed to produce the inflationary scenario they were looking for. Now, it did work at one point, right? Like, I mean, I fell for it. I was totally like in the hyperinflation scenario, totally going to kill the entire dollar, dollar, go bye-bye thing, right? And this is what I was feeling when the Federal Reserve was taking their balance sheet from $850 billion to over $4.5 trillion. It was a quadrupling of the balance sheet, way more money expansion in percentage terms than what we had experienced during the pandemic. And yet it failed to produce the inflation scenario that they were looking for, right? I had to figure out why. I didn't understand what it was that was taking place. I mean, I could not figure out why it was that a quadrupling of the money supply failed to produce the inflationary scenario that the Fed was looking for. They consistently ran under their 2% target. And it was a problem for them. Right? And this is what the Federal Reserve was now experiencing is that they had low neutral interest rate. And now this neutral interest rate is the rate in which that they are neither accommodating nor restricting the economy. And this is important to understand because most people don't even realize that there is a neutral interest rate. They think that interest rates can just be wherever they, you know, wherever the government or Biden or whatever, just people just think that it can just have this arbitrary number in which it can be at. It's not true. That's not the way it works. So there's a neutral interest rate. And this is the rate in which that the Federal Reserve is neither accommodating nor restricting the economy. And it's neutral. Well, that neutral interest rate became very close to zero, meaning that the Federal Reserve no longer had room to adjust their monetary policy in order to stimulate the economy. And they knew that that was going to be a problem. It turned into their words. The words were now going to adjust the, the, be the monetary policy and how it was that they were going to adjust these interest rates because the actual adjusting of interest rates wasn't going to work. But their words could get the people to behave as if those interest rates would move. And they do move when people begin to behave in a way that they feel that the Federal Reserve is going to be con conducting themselves. So this is important to understand because it's literally they're talking, they're jawboning, they're forward guidance, the credible threat that now guides these markets. Think about it. What has happened over the last four or five months since the Federal Reserve made that statement back at the end of last year, seven interest rate cuts coming in 2024. How many people ran out there and started buying houses? There was like, all of a sudden, all this activity in the mortgage market started to take place. People were like, woohoo, here we are. Lower interest rates coming into the future. Good times ahead. This is what a lot of people believed. Now, here we are four months later, and they're like, oh, man, inflation isn't going anywhere. We may actually have to hike rates actually increase rates where everybody just at the end of last year, like 90% of the people were convinced that there was going to be at least some 
interest rate cuts, when, whether it was seven or not, people who believed that there was going to be some. Now there's question on whether there's going to be any at all. And there is in, there's even like reasonable thought that there could be hikes. Right? And now this is important to understand because they'll all this, all this is still part of the credible threat theory. Right? Let's take it back to, uh, let me see, which one is this? Uh, Clarita, right? This is a speech given May 21st of 2020. It's titled U.S. Economic Outlook and Monetary Policy. Now, I'm not going to go through the entire speech. I'm just going to read from this one little section of it, but I think it explains a lot of how they continuously use this credible threat. And now here is a major example, but it was just a small portion of the economy, but yet it was so clearly defined as working for them. Literally their words, and they explain it right here. All right, so the speech goes like this. Since March 17th, the Federal Reserve Board has announced the establishment of no fewer than nine new facilities to support the flow of credit to households and businesses. These programs are authorized under the emergency lending powers granted to the Federal Reserve's Section 13.3 of the Federal Reserve Act and are available only in, quote, unusual and exigent circumstances and with consistent uh, with the consent of the Secretary of Treasury. I think you will agree that today we face in face circumstances that are both exigent and unusual. These facilities are supported, supported with money invested by the Department of Treasury, drawing on appropriations of more than $450 billion authorized by the Congressional or by Congress in the CARES Act, Coronavirus Aid Relief Economic Security Act, uh, for, for the specific purpose of investing in Fed programs to sustain the flow of credit to household firms and communities during the coronavirus pandemic. So this right here, this programs that they were talking about was going to backstop every corner of the financial market, right? This act of 13.3 was gonna set up nine lending facilities. Now, one of these, what he goes on to talk about, with these facilities, we are providing a bridge by stepping in and supporting lending throughout the economy until the recovery takes hold. This is their backstop. They were like, okay, if somebody needs a loan out there, we're gonna buy that loan. So go ahead and loan them the money and we'll be there to buy it. This is what they were trying to establish with these, with these special purpose vehicles, right? With these facilities. Okay, now, here it is. This is this is the this is the important part right here. These programs are designed to offer backstop sources of funding to the private sector. And just the announcement that these backstop facilities would soon be launched appears to have bolstered confidence in the capital markets. Allowing many companies to finance themselves privately, even before the facilities were up and running. Bang, credible threat. The credible threat of them being there to buy the corporate debt was enough for these markets to go ahead and start behaving in a way as if they were doing it and they were front running the Federal Reserve and they supported the cap they supported the corporations through the issuance of through the through their bond issuance by buying their bonds simply from the market believing that the Federal Reserve was going to be there with this facility to pick it up. Right? Right there. The backstop facilities would soon be launched, right? Oh, it, 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 the announcement that these backstop facilities would soon be launched appears to have bolstered confidence in the capital markets, allowing companies to finance themselves privately even before the facilities were up and running. The facilities hadn't even, they, they, the gold machine had not been built yet, right? But the idea of it was there and the markets knew it and they started acting accordingly. I mean, it was, it's, straight up this is how they do their business right now moving into what's happening right now is especially critical when we think back to the speech of monetary policy for a low neutral interest rate world because one of the problems that they were facing was that the neutral interest rate being low to zero gave them very little room to now adjust their federal refund, the Fed funds rate in order to stimulate the economy I mean if you're already at zero stimulating the economy doesn't dropping of interest rates doesn't work anymore. It's just like, you know, you're done, right? And so 
they knew that they were going to have to try and bring that Fed funds rate up significantly in order to get their ammo back, right? In order to have monetary policy functioning again, they have to be able to adjust that Fed funds rate. And if you're at zero, you're not going to be able to adjust it. You're, you're stuck. Like you can raise interest rates, but you can't lower them anymore. If you're at zero, you're done, right? So it was incredibly important that they had an inflationary scenario that allowed them to raise the Fed funds rate up in order to combat that inflation. This was like so critical. And remember, it was inflation expectations that were persistently too low rather than too high was the problem that they needed to solve at the time. Now, if you continue on with, with the low monetary policy for a low neutral interest rate world speech, he goes on to talk about ways that they can deal with this, right? Now, this downward shift, this is important to understand, this downward shift in inflation expectation has a second round effect on real interest rates, the economy, and inflation. When policy is constrained by the effective lower bound, right, so when policy has hit zero and they can no longer stimulate the economy, right, the downward shift in inflation expectations raises the real interest rates. Now, this is something that was very difficult for a lot of people. Like, it was difficult for me to even wrap my head around, like, what that means. If you lower the inflation expectation, you raise the real interest rates. This was something like, okay, how do you, what does that mean, right? Think about it like this, real simply. If you are an investor and you are anticipating on getting a 2% return, but you have an inflation expectation of 1%. The real interest rate that you will receive after inflation is 1%, right? Because you have this inflation expectation of 1%. You have this expectation that you are going to get a 2% return on your investment. After the inflation expectation, you will have a real return of 1%. Now, if you can lower the inflation expectation to zero, you will raise the real interest rate to 2% what the investor anticipates getting after the inflation expectation. So if inflation expectation is very low, it will raise the real interest rates. Now this is very, again, how does this mess with the economy, right? This downward shift in inflation expectation raises the real interest rates, further diminishing, diminishing the degree of monetary stimulus. So if you have a low inflation expectation, it will lower the degree of monetary stimulus, the effectiveness of it. If you have a high inflation expectation, it will raise the degree of stimulus in the, or the effectiveness of the stimulus packages. Okay? So this is important to understand. If they are going to issue out stimulus at the same time, it's best to have a high inflation expectation because that's where you're going to take most advantage of the stimulus package, right? And I guess the easiest way to understand that is, is that if you have a high inflation expectation going into the future with low interest rates today, right, then what you are going to have is the ability to spark the purchasing of things now of anticipation of them being worth or being cost costing more going into the future, right? So anyway, um, making the downward turn worse and inflation even more. Okay. And reducing inflation even more. This, the, if you lower the inflation expectations. Okay. Even in times when policy is not constrained, the expectation of a below target inflation in the future affects current decisions, putting additional downward, downward pressure on inflation. In other words, monetary policy is always swimming upstream fighting a current of too low of inflation expectation that interferes with achieving the target inflation rate. So all this time leading up even to the speech, the Federal Reserve had failed to achieve the 2% inflation target that they were looking for. They were consistently under it. They knew that they were failing. Even all the quantitative easing of one, two, three, and four, although did help a bit and did spark some inflation expectations going into the future, it failed. It didn't work. A quadrupling of the balance sheet failed the Federal Reserve to produce the inflation expectations that they were looking for that were going to be rather higher than lower because that's the problem that they were facing. With this low inflation expectation, it lowered the neutral interest rate, which made their monetary policy even more ineffective as the neutral interest rate became even closer to zero. Right? It was so critical that the Federal Reserve for their monetary policy had an inflation expectation that was persistently higher. In fact, it needed to be 
too high. Once they got the inflation expectation elevated, then they could start working with their monetary policy again. Now, part of this monetary policy was incorporating average inflation, right? Because what they were using was a target inflation rate. So if the, if the inflation rate was 2%, that was perfect. If it was above 2%, they would adjust monetary policy to bring it back down to 2%. If it was under 2%, again, they would adjust monetary policy to make it more stimulating to try and bring it back up to the 2% target. Letting all bygones be bygones, right? So it didn't matter what happened in the past, just go for this target no matter where you are. If you're above it or below it, just go for the target. And if you've screwed it up in the past, don't worry about it. Just keep your eye on the prize, right? That's kind of the idea behind it. But it failed them. It didn't work. Like they could not, could not maintain a 2% target at all, ever, never once. Has the Federal Reserve ever done it? Like the idea that they're going for a 2% target is completely delusional. They can't do it. They've tried. They tried for so long. They can't, right? And so it's just like, it's idiotic to think because they never, they never achieved it. Not once. Like, you know, they bounced off of it a couple of times, but never once ever being there consistently. All right. So here we go. The second option, because he has like these other options as far as dealing with the uh, with the interest rates. Okay, is average inflation targeting, whereby the central bank purposefully aims to achieve an above target inflation rate in good times, in good times, above above target inflation in good times. Right. Think about all the booming economy. Good times, right? Achieve above target inflation in good times when the lower bound is not constrained. This is what we're talking about right now. Properly designed, properly designed and implemented, such an overshoot can offset the inflation undershoot during bad times. Like all those times that we're talking about were being good times when the inflation was really low and everybody was talking about how awesome it was and like, you know, Trump's economy is better than Biden's economy or something like that. Think about what he was just saying right here. And like, I'm not trying to say that. I'm just trying to say this is kind of like the narrative going on out there, right? Think about that, right? Think about what he was saying there. And in times uh, to achieve above inflation target in good times when the lower bound is not constrained. Like almost the entire time it was in constraint. Right? Properly designed and implemented, such an overshoot can offset the inflation undershoot during bad times. <laughs> so long as the long run inflation rate is... In, uh, so long as the long run average inflation rate and inflation expectations are in line with the target. So this is, again, like very important to understand because this average inflation is what the Federal Reserve has moved to. Right. They made this statement a while ago, back at the beginning of 2002. And old Powell had a speech that he gave. Let me see if I can find the title of it here real quick for you. All right. The title of this is, is it, it was given August 27th, 2020, New Economic Challenges in the Fed's Monetary Policy Review. Now, again, I'm not going to read this whole speech. There's all kinds of really good stuff in here that explains all kinds of things that about the monetary policies. But I'm just going to come down here to this one section that follows up with the average inflation that John Williams was talking about back in 2018 prior to the pandemic. Now the pandemic has taken place. Here we go. This is what Powell has to say. All right. Um, we, have made a we have made important changes with regard to the price stability side of our mandate. Our long run goal continues to be an inflation rate of 2%. Our statement emphasizes that our actions to achieve both sides of our dual mandate will be most effective if long-term inflation expectations remained well anchored at 2%. However, if inflation runs below 2% following economic downturns but never moves above 2% even when the economy is strong, then over time inflation will average less than 2%. Households and businesses will come to expect this inflation or expect this result, meaning that inflation expectations would tend to move low below our inflation goal and pull realized inflation down. Think about towards the end of Trump's administration. There's no inflation. The Fed should be printing money, right? 
that was lowering the inflation expectation and it was messing with their monetary policy. But at the time, he was actually working in conjunction with the Federal Reserve because they were trying to raise the real interest rates at that moment by lowering the inflation expectations. All right, but moving on. To prevent this outcome, right? To prevent this outcome of this below inflation expectations, right? To prevent this outcome and adverse dynamics that could ensue, our new statement indicates that we will seek to achieve inflation that averages 2% over time, right? Therefore, following periods when inflation has been running below 2%, Appropriate monetary policy would likely to achieve aim to achieve inflation moderately above 2% for some time. In seeking to achieve inflation that averages 2% over time, we are thus not tying ourselves to a particular mathematical formula that defines the average. They're not going to come up with a mathematical formula for you. Unfortunate for you. No, no mathematical formula to tell you what average inflation rate is, right? In seeking to achieve inflation that averages 2% over time, we are not tying ourselves to a particular mathematical formula that defines the average. Thus, our approach could be viewed as a flexible form of average inflation targeting. Our decision about appropriate monetary policy will continue to reflect a broad array of considerations and will not be dictated by any formula. Of course, if excessive inflationary pressures were to build or inflation expectations were to ratchet above levels consistent with our goal, we will not hesitate to act. All right. Very important to understand because a lot of people don't realize that the Federal Reserve had changed. Like literally change the way that they view inflation. They do not go for this target anymore. They go for an above inflation target. All right? Seeking to achieve, achieve an average inflation rate over time. And this has not changed. A lot of people say, no, that's not the way they look at it anymore. That is not true. They are very much looking at it this way. And you can go and research that here at Bowman's speech given just the other day. Let me cruise up here and take a look. Uh, let's see here. April 5th, 2024, risk and uncertainties in monetary policy, current and past considerations. Uh, this is given by Michelle Bowman. Again, this was April 5th, 2024. Today's what, the 20th? April 20th, 420? 420 for all you weed smokers out there. All right, let me cruise down here. All right, now this is important, remember, because we just read about how... Powell saying that they changed the way that they view inflation and now it's an inflation target or an average inflation target, not an inflation target of 2%, but this average inflation rate over time. And a lot of people say, no, that's not the way they do it. They are going for a target. I mean, God, I don't know how many mainstream articles I read about this damn 2% target that the Federal Reserve is going for. It's, ooh, it's just so frustrating. Another notable, again, this is just the other day she said this, another notable change to the strategy statement was the adoption of what some refer to as asymmetric flexible average inflation targeting. Asymmetric flexible average inflation targeting, the AFAIT, <laughs> or temporary price level targeting. Okay. Specifically, the news statement noted that in order to achieve, or I'm sorry, in order to anchor long-term inflation expectations at its 2% goal, the committee seeks to achieve inflation that averages 2% over time <clears throat> and therefore judges that following periods when inflation has been running persistently below 2%, appropriate monetary policy will likely aim to achieve inflation moderately above 2% for some time. This was just stated the other day. Achieve inflation above 2% for some time. Nobody knows exactly how long some time is. Now, here we go. This is it. This is. I'm going to finally be done here in just a second. I just want to read one more thing. And this is coming from the Richmond Fed talking about the average inflation. And this is probably some of the most important part of this when it comes to trying to figure out what the hell it means when it comes to this average inflation since the Federal Reserve gives us no mathematical formula to figure out. I don't know how many people came to me and saying, well, if they do it over 10 years, if they learn, and they, and they start like trying to come up with the mathematical formula for figuring out what this average inflation rate is. It, don't try. There is none. There's no, the, the federal, even if you came up with one, it doesn't matter because the Federal Reserve is not looking at it like that. 
This is how the Federal Reserve is looking at it. Notably, in its update, the FOMC did not define the window of time over which it would look back to assess progress towards its goal, talking about the average inflation. By looking back far enough, it is possible to identify a starting date when average inflation through the present day has come in exactly at target. For example, when considering inflation from October of 2008, through August of 2023, headline PCE inflation averaged 2% per year on average, right on target. Did you guys get that part? See, there is a moment right now, if you took the current inflation rate and you started going backwards, averaging in the inflation, not you know from last year, from the year before, and you just keep going back, you are eventually going to find a time somewhere back there where the average inflation rate was 2%. That is what the Federal Reserve is looking at, right? And now it isn't defined. They're like, hey, we need it to be, you know, this far back or this, you know, whatever. They just say, hey, back there, there was a 2% average inflation rate. So they know where it is somewhere back there, right? And they know how to conduct themselves in a way that tries to bring that average inflation rate ever closer to them, right? So if you are trying to seek an average inflation rate over time, you have two ways of looking at it. Backward-looking average inflation and forward-looking average inflation. And now by this description of what they were saying at the Richmond Fed, this is backward-looking average inflation. And at some point, if you look back far enough, you're going to find that 2%. And if you keep inflation elevated in the current present time, you are going to bring that 2% timeline closer to your current moment. Eventually, it finds a spot where it cannot get any closer to you, where the, all the inflation that we have experienced and all the past deviations from inflation averaged out together, you will not be able to bring that 2% timeline any closer to your present moment. At this time, if inflation happens to be at 2%, right? I'm just hypothetically speaking, if the current inflation rate happens to be at 2% and the backward looking average inflation cannot be drawn any closer to your current moment, that would make the Federal Reserve essentially neutral or perfectly targeted on that 2%. At that moment, they could switch to forward-looking average inflation, where if they deviate away from the 2% target, they can make up from those past deviations again. This is how the Federal Reserve is looking at inflation. I don't know how the hell everybody else is thinking that they're looking at it. They got it wrong. Everybody. Like, literally everybody has it wrong if they are not looking at it like this. Because this is directly from the Federal Reserve itself. I didn't make anything up. None of it was like from my imagination. Every single statement I'm reading directly from the Federal Reserve websites themselves. All right. Okay. 420 people watching right now. Right on. Now let's go. 427, 147 likes. Go hit that like button. We're 33 minutes into this live stream. Oh my gosh, that was crazy. But that was a lot of information. I know it's stuff that I had covered in the past, but I think reiterating this information, having discussions about it, talking about the current events that are happening right now, considering some of the situations that are going on out there. I mean, Here's something that I thought was interesting um, that I wanted to bring up again, and I kind of just remembered it as I was uh, going through this. If you go and you look at Michelle Bowman's speech, right, there's actually a, uh, a spot in here talking about this long-term inflation strategy. And... Uh, and how it is that they plan on dealing with it. Because this is something that I thought was, uh, let me see if I can find it here. Um, previous versions of the statement had noted that the committee would seek to mitigate deviations of inflation from the long run goal and deviations of employment from the committee's assessment of maximum level. For more detail, look at the changes on this deal. So um, if I got this right, and I and I was reading it if I was reading it properly it, when I was going through this. They don't have any monetary policy necessarily incorporated. It's like they were trying to create an inflationary scenario, but they did not have a policy set to deal with an inflation scenario that was becoming out of control. 
And now they don't know exactly how it is to determine when inflation has gotten out of control, right? Because a lot of people said that, and, you know, I mean, if you listen to a lot of economists out there, they have already said that the Federal Reserve lost control of inflation and all that other stuff. What it comes down to is that if the inflation scenario is continuing to exist while there is incredibly low unemployment, the Federal Reserve won't move, right? Like if unemployment began to rise significantly, then the Federal Reserve would begin to act. But so long as unemployment stays low, the inflation can run high. Does that kind of make sense? Like I, that's what I was interpreting interpreting from what I was reading, coming from some of the statements from the Federal Reserve itself. And that, like, I guess the idea is, is that if you have a job, you can afford the higher prices, right? And now I'm not trying to like defend that idea or anything like that, but I'm just trying to say that's kind of like the view coming from the Federal Reserve. So long as unemployment stays low, inflation can run extra hot. And that's kind of like the makeup for it. And until one of those two things changes, the Federal Reserve is cool with that particular moment, you know? All right, I got 499 Super Chat. Let's go check that one out. All right. Ooh. All right, Mark Norman. Thank you so much for the 499, Simon. What do you think long term implications will be of interest payments on the debt nearing $1 trillion per year? I don't know, man. I mean, I I wish I could like come up and say, oh, man, the government can't afford it and we're all going to end up, you know, in the poor house or whatever because of it. But. I don't necessarily see the debt as the problem that a lot of people out there would anticipate it being. Because, I mean, we look at debt from our own personal view and we think, man, the more debt we have, the more in trouble we are in. The government doesn't really see it that way. And now whether or not it's a real problem, I mean, I do believe it's a real problem, especially for the future generations coming up because somebody's going to have to end up working to pay that debt. However just a few years ago if you were to go back to the times that this speech was given and you were to tell people hey man the interest rates are going to be double triple even quadruple what they are today they would have laughed at you they would have said no way can the government afford it everybody would be broke there's going to be seizing up of the financial markets total chaos in armageddon and the governments would shut down and would no longer function all right so this is what people were saying back then about high interest rates well here we are high interest rates are now existing how can they i don't know like you know more taxes less government more business more printing more i don't know how they're going to continue on with it but they seem to figure out some sort of concept to either keep kicking the can pushing it down further maybe we'll switch into central bank digital currencies you know we'll go digital get the cash out of the system that might give them a whole new arena to play in right that nobody even thought about some of the crazy ass you know concepts and tools that they could use then thank you for the 4.99 i wish i had a better answer for you but that's my opinion okay robert shields jr thank you so much for that 1999 man very cool of you bottom line i don't expect to see prices to return to anything close to pre-pandemic levels and the u.s being the reserve currency we have exported our inflation imposed a tax on us in effect ivory eat our debt in effect Oh, effectively erased our debt. Oh, I see what you're saying. Um, well, I don't know. This is what I find interesting is that people say that prices are never going to return or never going to come back down. And I'm in the retail space, right? So I'm selling lumber at prices that I sold it for back in 2017. So yes, the prices on lumber came back down. I'm selling plywood at prices that I had sold. I mean, it's incredibly high comparatively, but I mean, they're not too far off from the heights that I sold it for prior to the pandemic. Um, my wife who does all the grocery shopping, I mean, she was bringing, like showing me stuff that she was buying at the grocery store that she's got an incredibly good deal on. And I'm like, dang, that's like, pre-pandemic pricing, you know, like I'm not saying everything is going to come back down, but what I'm saying is, is like, I'm looking out there and I'm finding where there is a lot of stuff that had come back down to pre-pandemic -pre pricing. Now, whether it's an overstock of a particular item, so I just happen to find a really good deal or it stays consistently low like lumber has, right? 
to me, like I see things out there that are not stuck in an inflationary position or even stuck at those high prices like the good deals are out there they're coming down they're making themselves available they're presented but if we choose not to see them then we won't right we will see all the expensive stuff out there i even have people who come into the store all the time who pick up items and like they'll be like you know pay the price they're like man this inflation is killer you know it's just like it's just killing us and then I go and I check the price of the item that they just bought and I will see like, you know, it's, it hasn't changed. It hasn't changed in like five years, you know, or maybe the price went from like, you know, seven forty nine to seven ninety nine or something like that. It was just like, is that really a noticeable change? Like so much so like that 50 cents on that particular item was killing you, you know, kind of idea. Like granted it is a, you know, a fairly significant amount, but it's not like so extreme that it's just like, oh God, it's killing me, you know? So I think a lot of people's idea of inflation is literally perception. It's just what they see out there. And then of course, a lot of times, you know, for like, I know for me, especially when, you know, having the family and not a lot of income, there was really just two things that I would end up spending a lot of my money on. And that was food and fuel, right? Or energy. And with those two things being expensive, that was the majority of what I would spend my money on. I didn't see anything else out there other than that, you know? All right, moving on. All right, thank you, Wobbles, for the $10. Man, very cool of you. Hit me up with that super chat. Uh, I finally stacked my first... Oh, here we go. Just put myself in the eye. All right. Uh, I finally stacked my first 50 ounces of silver, all in U.S. Eagles. It's been a while. Your videos helped me through some bad times. Going to buy land soon. Keep it going, Simon. Well... Right on, man. Thank you, Wobbles, for the $10. And, you know, yeah, I'm glad you got into the... Uh, oh, I'll just pop those. Um, I'm glad you're getting into the silver, man. What It's a great way to save, right? And this is one of the things that I have encouraged people from the very beginning, that if you have no savings, no investments, no idea what it is you need to do, start buying silver, right? It doesn't cost that much. It's like, you know, a single ounce of silver, it's like, you know, well, today it's going to be a little bit more, but... You know, it doesn't cost you that much for, you know, what, 35 bucks or so. You could probably pick up a, a silver round, even cheaper than that if you're if you're lucky at it. I mean, you don't even have to be that lucky. That's kind of actually a high premium mm -hmm. for today. But you start picking up those silver rounds, you start stacking those things up. You don't really miss the money that much, right? You know, the first day you do, you know, like, oh, man, I just blew 30 bucks on this thing. But then you don't think about it the next day. And then after that, you don't even really care and you keep stacking those things up pretty soon you have a fairly decent amount of silver right that now gives you the ability to like say hey if i needed to i can make a car payment or i can make that you know the the power bill or whatever you have like this stack there that now gives you some sort of comfort that you have like almost like a, an emergency savings there but it's not even really an emergency savings because you really have to go in like find somebody to buy it, right? You have to force yourself to go out there and change it over to cash, which now makes it even better because it's more like an insurance policy to protect you from those outside unforeseen things, those third party issues that come up. You don't have to worry about a bank. You don't have to worry about an app. You don't have to worry about an envelope coming in the mail. You don't have to worry about any of that stuff. So sitting there holding on to silver bullion as an insurance policy, kind of like a safety precaution, really gives you the ability to sleep at night. And again, if you're like trying to start off with like savings or investments or anything, it's a great way to go. And I encourage everybody to at least have some silver, if not, you know, a fairly decent amount of it. All right, 457 people watching right now. I love it. 202 comment or 202 likes. Go hit that like button for me. Emily, thank you so much for the $2. Keep up the good work. Well, thank you so much, Emily. I really appreciate the $2. All right, Seal Nighter's up in here. Brody, thank you guys for being here. Dishes, hit the like button. Mickey, uh, America is a great country, has lots of natural resources. It will do even, it will do good even moving forward. Energy to natural gas, so it will do good. Uh, economic news is a rush. What is that? A Rochesse test? I don't know what that is. 
Doomer's gonna doom. The better life gets, the worse some people seem to think it's going to get. What? The better life gets, the worse some people seem to think it's going to get. I appreciate your overall optimism in this space. Well, thank you, David. Um, no, we do. Like, I mean, a lot of people just kind of look at, like, even things like AI is coming to destroy your world. And I'm thinking, no, it's not. It's going to come and, like, give us all kinds of conveniences. Like, that's going to make our world awesome. I don't know why. Why? I mean, I could see, like, the you know, the Terminator kind of aspect of things, but I don't, I don't really look at it like that. That's like, you know, that's for the people who are worried. I'm not worried. Like, I mean, I enjoy like the idea of what my life is going to be like going into the future. And I think conveniences are nice. Like I enjoy conveniences. I don't know why people would like want to deny that out of their life. Yeah. All right. Uh, okay. Yeah, so pay attention. How can you tell if silver is real silver or not? That's a good question, Larry. Um, I think at today's price, at the lower spot price of being like, you know, under $30 an ounce, even under $50 an ounce, I think trying to like produce imitation silver or some sort of like, you know, fake bullion could be kind of difficult because really there's not a whole lot of things out there that are going to be the size and weight of silver, right? So like if you basically have a chunk of metal that is that size and weighs that amount, it, there's not a lot of stuff out there that can do that, right? Now I'm not saying that it's impossible because it is possible to do it, but you know, really the amount of effort that would go into doing that in order to get the spot price of silver doesn't really make it that cost effective like you know if it was up at a hundred dollars an ounce then I would be a lot more worried about it and even at fifty dollars an ounce it's probably something to worry about but down at like you know twenty thirty dollars an ounce I can't imagine a whole lot of imitation silver coming out that's going to weigh exactly right and be that exact size so that's you know one way to just kind of tell is just like you know there's not a lot of stuff that can do that gold is a little different because there's an investment that can go into that like you know you can fill it with tungsten and other things to try and and try and create the weight and just coat it with a silver you know plating or something or with a gold plating and try and duplicate the coin that way and and you know, make some money off of a, a fake coin in that sense so gold i would be a lot more concerned about than silver but then you can also do things like you know get some rare earth magnets and stuff like that to see if there's any impurities in it and um you know go through some of the some of the things or just stick with reputable dealers you know that's another thing like at first if you don't know what you're doing just stick with like good reputable dealers and then you'll you know get the eye for it and understand you know what it is that you're looking at hey dude you're awesome i refer many many to your channel well thank you so much em i appreciate it you know, like I said, I think we discuss things on this channel that a lot of people just don't don't talk about. Like this theory alone, it's not even a theory. This is monetary policy. What I have talked about for the last half hour was is the way that monetary policy is being conducted. I don't know what it is that everybody else seems to think out there. I don't know how it is that they feel that Joe Biden has some sort of control over the Fed funds rate. There's nothing within all these documents and everything that I have been tracking through many different administrations and timelines and all the other stuff do I ever find where the president has any control over interest rates ever, like ever, right? Even the great Donald Trump, the Fed should be printing money, lower interest rates, going in the negative territory. The Fed didn't do it. The Fed was doing exactly the opposite. They do what they do for monetary policy, regardless of the administrations. Right? And I mean, I don't, like, I cannot find, I would love, I would love to find the information that contradicts that statement. I would love to. I would love to be like, bam, there you guys go. You are jerks, right? Well, they are jerks, but they're not really jerks. They're just conducting themselves in what they feel is the appropriate monetary policy. Now, whether or not that's appropriate for me or you or anybody else out there, that's, you know, that's objective, really. Um, but I believe that Congress Argers. They do not take our best interest in mind. They do not have the Constitution at their forefront, right? That's the that's a major problem for me. It's one of the reasons why I don't trust them at all. I don't trust these guys either, but at least they're trying to act systematically. 
right? And I mean, that's at least gives you some sort of idea that, okay, this gives me some sort of logical thing that I can follow, right? It's not logical. It doesn't necessarily make sense. They are somewhat creatures of interpretation, just like anybody else is going to about what's going on within the economy. But at least they have some sort of system. They have models here that they work with and, you know, kind of like an idea of what it is that they plan for the future. This is five run five year long monetary policy that they're going to review at the end of the year. At that point, we are going to have to take it upon ourselves to figure out what it is that they are changing about the monetary policy so that we can continue to conduct ourselves again in the most appropriate fashion. But again, like I look out there at most of the mainstream media and they all got it wrong. So wrong. Like everybody, like everybody got it wrong. <laughs> And that's what makes me feel is it's like, man, how is it that, I mean, am I the one who's wrong? You know, and like going through all this paperwork, finding all these documents coming from the monetary policy makers themselves. And yet nobody else can see it like this. Hmm. That's weird. Like, you know, at some point it was just like, well, it's gotta be me. Right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, is pronounced Rorschach test. Okay, I'm gonna have to look that one up. Hey, Matt, what's happening? Uh, have you ever been to Port Angeles, Washington? If so, what did you think? Um, yeah. And I'm trying to remember what I was doing there. I think, weren't we catching, I think Sarah and I, didn't we catch a ferry to Canada or something up there? I think that's what we were doing. <laughs> Um, it's the test with boots of ink where you state what you think it is. Oh, like the blot test kind of things. I see. All right. What does everyone feel about cannabis stock and their potential for success? I have very, very low value for weed or the weed stocks. I have been considering large position of this sector despite the recent downtrend. Slow motion, Joe. I'm going to give you some advice that I never do. Don't buy marijuana stocks. Okay. I'm going to give you my opinion on that right now. Now go for it if you want, man. But I'm going to tell you from somebody who grew up in Oregon where weed has never been a crime. You got to understand that weed was never a crime my entire life when I lived here in Oregon. All right. It was a misdemeanor. If you had possession of an ounce or less and you did not have a package for distribution and you were not manufacturing and you weren't driving, Nothing happened to you. They confiscated your weed. They wrote you a ticket and said, have a nice day. See you later, bud. Right? It was a $600 misdemeanor ticket. No big deal. Right? I mean, it was a big deal. People didn't like paying it. But it, the fact is, is that nobody's life got ruined over it. Oregon is a very, very liberal state. Right? Especially when it comes to the consumption of marijuana. It is no big deal here. Everybody does it. Right? Now, something that I find very interesting about marijuana is that it doesn't take any kind of special talent, skill, even know-how, anything. Like, you don't need to know anything about how to grow weed. In fact, a buddy of mine threw some plants behind his woodshed and kind of forgot about them. Didn't even realize they were there. And at the end of the season, that was killer weed. He grew killer weed, forgot about it. Like it just grows all on its own, right? It's just a weed. Now, on the same flip side of that, if you have a brewer or somebody who is who can make wine or something of that nature, right? Now you go to that brewer and you tell that guy, man, I want to make beer. I want to brew some beer. And tell me exactly how you brew the best beer that everybody consumes around here, right? Everybody loves your beer. How do you brew that stuff, man? Tell me. And he can tell you to a T, we're like right up every single little tiny step right down to the tiniest little detail of what it is that he does in order to brew beer. Give you the instructions. You go and follow those instructions to what you feel is exactly the way that he described them and gave them to you. And I guarantee you, your beer will not taste like his. It won't. It just won't, right? It will not taste like his. It's because every single person is different when it comes to the crafting of beer. 
right? And I'm not trying to say that there isn't good marijuana growers out there. There's some people out there who really understand the plant. They know how to grow an abundance yield. They know how to grow powerful weed. They know how to do this thing, but it doesn't really take any kind of special talent, right? Anybody can grow weed. It grows in an abundance. There is a huge, huge oversupply of weed that has taken place here in Oregon. The flower is essentially worthless unless you are growing the absolute finest weed, right? Because I talked to the dispensaries down here. I know these guys, right? And their business owners, just like everybody else around here, you know, trying to figure out what's going on in the economy. Weed was one of the few things that never faced an inflationary pressure. All the money printing going burr didn't go into weed. Nothing. In fact, weed was in a deflationary aspect during the time when everything else was hitting, being hit with inflation because of the massive oversupply that was being produced here in Oregon. Right? So now dispensaries have problems, farmers having problems, everybody has problems with it. The only people who really do any kind of like decent, from what I can gather, any kind of decent business within the cannabis industries are people who are processing. Like the people who are testing, the people who are processing it, making you know it into other products or something like that. Those are the people who really make money. But farmers, it's an over, it's an overabundance. Like you know, it's practically spills out on the ground. It's you know a sea of green out there. I just don't find any value in weed whatsoever. Besides that, it's like at least with beer or something like that, there's calories. Like you can actually get something out of it. But with weed, there is nothing. There is literally nothing there right except for the ability to get high now there is a powerful medicine of the cbd but that's not why people are buying weed right i mean there are a bunch of people who do use this you know the cbd part of things which is a very powerful medicine and a lot of you know good positive results have come from it but the majority of marijuana is going to get high right so that's my opinion on it. Da, da, da. Boom, look at all these comments, my goodness, okay. Um, you don't find any value in weed until you run out. <laughs> all right, they overregulated it in California and caused robberies of grow spots to skyrocket. Um, weed was better illegal. <laughs> I think the Fed will end the average inflation strategy at the meeting. Powell basically implied that it is sen uh, Senate testimony. I agree, but that's not happening until they're not even reviewing that. Remember, they're not reviewing that until the end of the year. So until then, even if they do, even if they, even every single one of them had the mindset of, hey, we need to abandon this whole thing, unless they actually come out and state it, they're not. They're going to continue on with, the, with their monetary policy and the way that they had talked about it and conducting themselves until that review process has come, come to that fruition, right? They, they're, these people are acting a lot more systematically than, than what I think a lot of people realize. Like they have models and projections and different things. Like if this happens, they do this. If this happens, they do that. They have like this, you know, like open up the book. Okay, if this, then this, then this, then this, right? And it's a systematic process that they go through. They're not making this stuff up off, off, this, off the cuff, right? Not even during the pandemic with the setting up of the special purpose vehicles and all that other stuff. It happened too quickly. They, they knew what it was that they needed to do in case of, of a particular scenarios that would begin to hit the economy. They have these plans set up. They don't talk about them because they're unusual and exigent circumstance tools, which means that they don't have them available for their deployment. And they certainly do not want to express those tools to the markets, giving them the feeling that they have this backstop that isn't really technically available to them. Does that make sense? Like, unless the unusual and exigent circumstance comes up, this tool isn't available. But if the markets know that tool is available, then the unusual and exigent circumstance wouldn't be unusual and exigent, right? Because the markets would then start incorporating or start, uh, you know, bringing that information into their into their strategies. That hey, if we get to this certain level, it doesn't matter. The Fed's going to kick in with their safety net, you know. And so they can't express those things to the market itself, but they exist. I know they do because they talk about the 
you know, the tools to deal with particular situations. They just don't describe them or what they are. Good choice for depression. People are not beating themselves with beer. No. Yeah, but I think you kind of missed the point. All right. AUE, 100 mile, checking in. I'm going fishing. Keep fighting the good fight. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. All right. Hemp fuel. Um, on delay on video, I read it takes 15 cents to print a $100 bill. Easy money. <laughs> All right. We need cash and back it up with commodities. Nah, I would be a little nervous with the... Uh, with a commodity based currency, you know, just simply because we do not produce enough in this nation. And so if there was a commodity based currency out there, we would end up sending all our commodities out to the rest of the world in order to maintain our standard of living. Um, there is a video of sheeps eating weed on YouTube and they get high. <laughs> Uh, it's up to hen population to change, not the government. It's up to the population. Until the end of the year means after the election and all things whenever to say, well, yeah, but they said that five years ago, right? They said in five years, we got a five year plan here in five years, we'll review this. Like, you know, it's like whether they timed that for election or just timed it for their monetary policy, it's just like. I don't think they care, you know? Um, they're not waiting to the, after the election. It's just that's when it's happening, you know? I mean, if you want to incorporate that and give it importance, then I would imagine that the decisions that you make in your life would then be reflected by that, and therefore it would have importance into your into your outcomes. But if you don't give that importance to it, then you wouldn't be making decisions based on that, right? On the election part of things is what I guess I'm getting at. Like I look at the monetary policy review and I just exclude the whole election part of things out of it because that's not important to me, right? So I don't make decisions on based whether or not this guy or that guy is going to get elected or however, I make my decisions based on where it is that I feel that the monetary policy is going to be, where interest rates are going to go, how it is that I'm going to invest into that or save or, you know, whatever it is that I plan on doing. But as far as the election, I don't, I don't consider that because if I did, then the outcomes of those elections would then have impact in my life. Right? You see the difference inside of that? Like the impacts that I have in my life, I have because of the importance that I put on some of the externals that are out there. And if I put an importance on the external of like politicians, then whatever decisions that they make would then begin to impact my life. But if I don't even know they exist, right? Then <laughs> like they don't change my life none. You know, and that's what I find really comical about a lot of stuff out there is that people put all this importance from politicians in their life and then they get pissed when things don't work out the way that they were hoping for is because they have all these external expectations coming from it. Like I don't, right? you know, I look at what the Federal Reserve is doing. I don't expect them to conduct themselves in a way that's going to be appropriate for me. Right? I have no expectation of that. Right? So therefore, I have to understand what it is that they plan on doing so there I can go and make my best decisions for myself you know i don't understand why they would end the average inflation targeting policy they may not they they may not they may keep it going like we don't know what they plan on doing once they get there and do that review they may get to review and say looks like everything's going well continue on the same All right we're going to continue on for another five years exactly like this and that will be their decision at the time so i don't know if they will change we never should have been legalized, period. Uh, I don't know about that. I mean, it's, it's never, was, never was a crime here. It should never have been a crime. How about that? I don't know about necessarily legalized, but it shouldn't be a crime. You know? As it should have never been illegal or for profit. Yeah. Um, just a system. I'm thinking scales are titled a bit. Yeah, okay, I agree with that. Yeah. One hundred percent all nighter. Um Dominic, like they said in the speech, the average is already above two now pretty far back. Yeah, and so now that's the thing. Like if you go all the way back to the great financial crisis, I mean we're talking fifteen to almost you know, almost sixteen years ago, right? 
And we've had like a few years of some major inflation, but how much lack of inflation were we experiencing for the decade prior to this? Right? A lot. And so there's a lot to make up for. And considering that, you know, it was a problem that they needed to solve, right? I think it's, I think it's solved. <laughs> All right, guys, I don't know, what time is it? 10.14, all right, I'm gonna give it like another 10 minutes here and then we gotta go get ready a haircut. Uh, what's your take on the guy who lit himself on fire outside of Trump's courthouse? <sighs> Sad state. All right, drink beer and eat sauce. <laughs> Beer belly says otherwise. All right. Are beetle kill amounts and organ impacting supply mills as the situation in the beetle? No. I think it's really the political environment here that has now made log, log costs going to the mills very expensive. And now the mills are not able to operate at a profitable position because of that. That's really the major impact that I see taking place within Oregon right now. Now, how long or how much that continues to create those you know pressures within the timber industry here in oregon i don't know but it seems to be pretty pretty impactful as of right now um, um and i mean they've talked about the beetle kills and stuff like that but i haven't seen it so much that it has like messed with the supply of things you know all right what do we actually export to the rest of the world a lot of agricultural products just just for example coming out of the columbia river like most of the freighters that are leaving leave with logs wheat uh pot ash um i don't know they got all kinds of flax seeds and all kinds of like weird grains and stuff like that that they produce over in the uh over in the eastern part of the state. So the Columbia River is a major exporter of agricultural goods going over to the Asian Asian nations. Um, let's see, let me cruise down here and get closer. Oh, hey, we got another super chat. Pedros Peter Bredesen, oops. Thank you for the nine ninety nine, man. You guys are hitting me up with the super chats. I'm loving it. All right. Keep up the great work and God bless you and your family. Okay, Simon. Hey, well, thank you so much, man. I really appreciate the support. You know, you guys are so awesome here on this channel. I mean, I've said it before, but you guys have absolutely changed my life and I cannot thank you enough for it. I mean, there was a time when I didn't know what the hell it was I was going to do. 40 years old, drunk and dead. No real ambition to do anything with my life at all. And, you know, giving up the alcohol and trying to say, okay, man, I need to do something different, putting out this YouTube channel and trying to be consistent on putting out videos and then this community coming together, you know, in the way that it has, I mean, holy crap, just absolutely incredible. Thank you so much. And, uh, oh, I got to talk to all nighter, by the way, we're going to set up to go to, uh, to the rebel capitalist event next month. Right, and it was pretty cool. George put me in as a VIP guest on the uh, on the website. So if you go to Rebel Capitalist Live and cruise all the way to the very bottom of the website, there you'll see my image there on the VIP guest list. <laughs> Good old George, what a great guy, man. All right, you're right, Simon. Shipping costs is outrageous. All right, get them back. Stop buying. You either live long enough to be a great comedian or die young mediocrity. Uh, yeah. America exports debt by the metric ton. The world needs it. <laughs> lumber futures selling. Um, yeah, lumber futures are dropping quite a bit. We did a video yesterday on it. Oh, hey, here we go. Another super sticker from M. $2 Canadian. Thank you so much, man. All right. Yeah. Alcohol can be devastating if you do it long enough. Yeah. And even if you don't do it long enough, like I don't get me wrong, like I found some of the greatest times that I have ever experienced with people was, you know, sitting around, you know, drinking and having a great time or doing whatever. And so I don't I would never want to give up all those memories that I've had. But the lack of. Of progress in my life that I 
that I I blame on myself, but really it came down to me rather drinking than going and actually pursuing excellence within my life. And I did it for so long. And it's really hard to like, it's really hard to reel in the idea and say, hey man, everything's cool. Like you can have a beer, hang out with your friends and stuff like that and not have this idea that I would just fall right back into that deterioration again. It is. It was so overwhelming at one time in my life that I didn't think I was gonna have any kind of other thing going on. I was just gonna be a miserable, drunken, loser, ever, whatever, you know? And I, and I say that, but you know, really my wife has to actually correct me on that. She goes, you know, we were doing a lot of stuff. We weren't just complete losers at that time. We were actually active. We were doing certain things. And she was right about that. Like, I mean, we were, you know, trying different things in our life. You know, we were trying to buy a house. I was trying to actively help my buddy get a construction company up off the ground. I was, you know, doing things in my life that I would give the like resemblance of chasing excellence, but that was only for eight hours out of the day. The rest of my time I was spending basically the opposite of that. And that's really where the problems came in. It was just like I would work really hard so that I could go and drink really hard, you know? And that's like, it doesn't, it doesn't work like that. So, yeah, and it's a whole different world now, you know? All right, what time is it? Okay, guys, I'm going to give it five more minutes and then we're going to call it quits. Don't be an alcoholic, be an alcoholist. <laughs> you know, it was funny, like, was I saw a funny meme the other day or it was real or something. It said like, if you have a problem, just replace the word problem with opportunity. And the guy says, I have a severe drinking opportunity ahead of me. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that was me, man. All right. I drink for health reasons. Yeah, that's what I can. <laughs> Alcohol is the great procrastinator straight up. I mean, big time. We are just in the cycle of life. We have good times, bad times, but we just have to be wise what we choose, for sure. Uh, keep us posted, Larry. Thanks. All right, thanks, UV. Yeah, you bet, guys. This has been a really fun stream. We got $48.65 in Super Chats because you guys are always so supportive of this channel. 397 people, 95 people watching with 283 likes. I always love it when you hit that like button. The video uh, algorithm loves it when you guys hit that like button, comment. All the engagements has the algorithm picking this video up and sending it around for more people to join in. Um, Today we talked about monetary policy, broke it all down into a way that I feel that not a lot of people are really discussing, and yet this is very clearly, in my opinion, very clearly what it is that the monetary policy coming from the Federal Reserve is. And a good chunk of it is literally their words, right? And how it is that the markets are per per <laughs> perceiving those words and what it is that they are doing that then conducts themselves in a way that the Federal Reserve feels is most appropriate for the monetary policy. They don't have to do anything. All they have to do is just say that they're gonna do something and that's enough to start changing the markets. All righty guys. There it goes, Wayne, bring them back. Okay. Dip their tools in alcohol to keep them sterile. All right. Uh, the like button has been fully flicked right on. Smoke weed every day. Alrighty, Ultra. You guys have a great time. It's 420. Hope you all enjoy the supposed weird marijuana holiday that we <laughs> that we have here on April 20th. So, uh, damn on. Good point. Great live stream. All right, guys. Uneducated economist, you let me know.